Okay, so now that we've seen where supply curves come from and where demand curves come from, and they're actual things that exist out in the world, um, we need to briefly revisit this idea of elasticity and how responsive people are to changes in prices. So we've already seen this slide from a couple sessions ago, um, where elasticity is this idea of how responsive people are to changes in price. So if the price of something changes a lot, then people will move away from it um, because it's too expensive. Or if the price goes down, um, then people will, will flock to it. And there's an actual numeric value we can put on how responsive people are. And we'll look at that, that numeric value in a minute here. Um, but again, the way you interpret this here, or the way you calculate this, this is the formula for it. Um, you don't need to memorize this. I will, like, this formula is on the resources page. Um, I have an example that walks you through how to actually calculate this on the resources page. So go consult that. Um, what it means, the way you interpret this, it's the percent change in demand that follows a 1% change in price. Um, so if price changes by 1%, then demand will change by some other percent. Um, what I typically like to do, because it's hard to think about changes in 1% of price, um, like if, if something costs $3 and it changes, it goes up by 1% in price, that means it's going to go from $3 to $3.03. And not very many people are going to stop buying something because it changes in price by like $0.03. Cents. That's a very, very tiny amount. And so what I like to do is I multiply this 1% change in price by 10. So I say, if the price changes by 10%, how much does demand change in response? And so if the price of something that's $3 goes to $3.30, more people are going to jump away from that, and that's going to be more visible, and it's going to be more interpretable. So for instance, if you have an elasticity value of 2, that means that if the price increases by 10%, then the quantity will decrease by 20%. So more people will move away from it. Um, it won't be perfectly um, kind of in equilibrium. 10% it goes up and then 10% of people go away. More people will go away from it. Um, if the elasticity value is like 0.5, that means if the price goes up by 10%, the quantity will go down, but only by 5%, just a little bit. So people will start moving away from the product, but they'll mostly stick with it, but just be sad that it's more expensive. Um, and these generally go in opposite directions. As quantity goes up, price goes down. As quantity goes down, price goes up. And they, they move in opposite directions here. Um, we also talked about the scale of this um, elasticity score, um, where it ranges from 0 to infinity. Um, 1 is where it's perfectly unit elastic. That means if the price changes, here we go, we'll show them all here. So if the price changes by 10%, then it will then demand will also change by 10% in the opposite direction. That rarely happens in real life. We don't actually care about perfectly unit elastic things. What we really care about is that when numbers are greater than one, it means the change in price changes the quantity a lot. And if the elasticity value is less than one, it means changes in price change the quantity just a little bit. And so that, that's kind of what we really care about. Um, we talked about these different examples here um, of, of what it looks like in real life when you have an, an elastic good and an elastic good. Elastic means that it's easy to substitute away from it. So if the price of your favorite brand of flour goes up, um, you can just buy generic flour because it's just flour. Um, but if the price of your favorite asthma medicine goes up and it's the only asthma medicine that works for you, you're going to have to suck it up and pay more and it's going to be awful. Um, we see this with EpiPens, with AIDS medicine, with other things that kind of there are no substitutes for it. Um, the demand for these things is very inelastic and people just kind of have to live with it and demand is not going to change much um, when prices change. So. The reason we care about this in public policy is that when you tax things, it changes their price, which means people respond by either buying less of something or more of something. If you have a subsidy to encourage people to buy stuff, um, people are going to buy more or not as much more as you were hoping based on the elasticity of the thing. Um, and so when you change price, it changes the quantity. So if you tax something that is elastic, that will make the quantities go down a lot. And if you're trying to rely on like steady tax revenues, um, you can actually destroy that market and people will just run away from it. Um, sometimes that's OK if you're trying to um, stop people from drinking soda, for example, or stop people from buying cigarettes. You'll want to impose a tax on those things, um, even though they're fairly elastic, because you want people to stop buying them. 
And so in this situation, it's, it's something called a sin tax, where you're levying a tax on something that you're trying to discourage the consumption of. You're not trying to rely on steady revenue from soda. Um, you're just trying to get rid of it. And so taxing elastic goods in that situation is okay. Um, when you tax inelastic goods, it makes the quantity goes, quantities go down just a little bit, but it maintains fairly stable um, revenue streams. And so this is why um, property taxes are so popular. And when your property tax goes up, you're very unlikely to just pick up your house and move somewhere else because it's really hard to move. It's really hard to sell your house. Um, and so you're very inelastic when it comes to property taxes. And so uh, local governments rely heavily on, um, on property taxes because of that, because it's a very inelastic thing. So the cool thing about this is demand curves actually show the elasticity of things. Um, so we, in the, the past couple sections, we looked at the demand for Cheerios that was based on an actual survey. We looked at the demand for hair regrowth products that was based on an actual survey. And based on those surveys, you can figure out the elasticity of these different products at different prices um, based just, just knowing the demand curve. The tricky part about this is that it's not actually um, perfectly visible in a demand curve. Um, the elasticities are not the same as the demand curve. They're not like a specific part of it. They're not like slopes. It's not anything based on calculus, but it is visible in the demand curve. And so one single line, like a linear demand curve that just goes from one edge of a graph down to the bottom, it's going to have a ton of different elasticities all the way down. Um, and in the resources page for um, elasticity, I show you how to calculate this and I show you how much it changes as you move down the, the demand curve. What you really need to know for this class is if you have a demand curve like this, notice how it starts at zero, um, up at like 55, and then it comes down to, I think it, it cuts off at, a, at 10 here, but it goes all the way down to 11 right here. Um, so the whole demand curve goes from zero to 11. Um, anything in the first half of the demand curve up here is elastic. So that means if the current price of something is $50, and then the price changes up to like $55, tons of people are gonna flock away from it. Um, or if the price goes from $50 and down to 45, lots of people are gonna start buying it. Um, and that's gonna, there's gonna be bigger changes here in the early side of the demand curve. In the later half of the demand curve, this is more of the inelastic world, um, where if the price is currently like $10 and it goes up to 20, um, some people are going to stop buying it, but not a ton. You're going to go from like nine to eight, um, which in percent change terms, like eight is kind of a big chunk of nine. You're not moving down. That's not a big percent change. When you're moving from, from two to one, that's like a huge, that's like a 50% drop in people buying your stuff. And so this world up here in the early side of the demand curve, this is the elastic world down in this second half of the demand curve, this is the inelastic world. The point right in the middle is where you have um, unit elasticity, which again, we don't really care about. That's just kind of where it switches from being elastic to inelastic. Um, and it happens to be the midpoint of a linear demand curve. If the demand curve is not linear, if it's, cur if it's curvy, um, like the Cheerios graph, for instance, the midpoint of that is not going to be the point where elasticity changes. It's going to be somewhere else. It's not directly related. Um, but again, like when you have a linear thing like this, that's, that's the easiest way to remember where elasticity is, is um, when you're up in this early world here, that's going to be the elastic stuff. When you're down in this world here, that's the inelastic stuff. And so if you have your supply line crossing up here, the product that you're dealing with is going to be pretty elastic. If you have the supply curve crossing down here, that's going to be fairly inelastic. And so that's kind of an, an easy way to remember um, where you can see elasticity in these demand curves.